Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to uh, today's session of, on the professionalism seminar series. Um, uh, we are so delighted uh, that our guest today is, is Dr. Molly Cook from the University of California at San Francisco Medical Center. Um, uh, it's, it's a real treat to welcome Molly um, back to the University of Chicago um, after a few years uh, in California. Um, uh, Molly is really one of the um, premier medical educators uh, in the United States. Um, she helped found the uh, general medicine division um, at UCSF, um, uh, something that, uh, that I was involved in here at the university, although she's sort of a generation behind me uh, oh. in, <laughs> in doing that. Uh, she went on uh, uh, to, uh, to hold the William Irwin Endowed Chair as director of the Academy of Medical Edu Educators at UCSF, and, and recently w was appointed, by recently I mean this week, was appointed director of education for the new Global Health Sciences Initiative that Dr. Haile DeBas has, has um, organized uh, out there uh, in California. Um, Molly, uh, Molly uh, uh, has been awarded, let me just see this, twice received the Kaiser Family Foundation Teaching Award, uh, as well as the UCSF um, Academic Senate Award for Distinction in Teaching. And in 2006, she was awarded the AOA Robert Glazer Distinguished Teacher Award by the Association of American Medical Colleges. And in 2010, received the Career Achievement Award in Education from the Society for General Internal Medicine. You get the idea. I, I could go on. <laughs> Among all of her other achievements, um, uh, Molly Cook and David Irby were, were the lead authors on the book that came out last year called Educating Physicians. Um, many of you know about this book. This was a book that was commissioned by the uh, Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching on the 100th anniversary of the original Flexner Report. The Flexner Report of 1909, which established uh, the direction of American medical education for the next 100 years uh, and, and made the United States the premier medical educator in the world for a century, um, felt that it was time to rethink the, um, the future of medical education. And so the same foundation, it's it's wonderful that these foundations last for a hundred years, but the same foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, commissioned uh, uh, Dr. Cook and Dr. Irby um, to spend four or five years doing research and thinking and writing, which led to the book called Educating Physicians, A Call for Reform of Medical School and Residency. Um, fabulous book. Um, and. Um, um, Actually, David Irby was here about was he? two years ago mm -hmm. and spoke a little bit about the book. Um, now, now let me just tell you about the what might have beens before I <laughs> turn the, the floor over to Molly to talk about medical education uh, and aspirational view of physician professionalism. Molly reminded me that she and I first met can I tell, tell when? Yeah, sure. In December of 76, when Molly was looking for an internship. And she came to the University of Chicago and interviewed uh, for an internship here, which I promise you we, we made an offer of, <laughs> uh, but elected to go to UCSF. UCSF, where she's been ever since. So that, that's the, that's the might have beens. Uh, had, had we succeeded in recruiting Molly at that time for her internship, um, this book might have been written at the University of Chicago. So join me in welcoming Molly Cook. Let me 
just check in. So I'm live. Thanks so much. It's really a, a, a joy to be here. What Dr. Siegler didn't say, though, uh, it was, I think, hidden in the introduction by implication, is that <coughs> he was my interviewer. And I, I came within a hair of coming. Uh, I was, um, it was just a magical hour. I'm sure it was meant to be one of those pro forma half an hour things. And we, um, may I say, we have been friends ever since. Uh, uh, he has taken an enormous interest in my career. Um, and um, I have uh, responded with great affection and admiration. Uh, it, uh, it's really been a, a, just a lovely relationship. Uh, so it, it's a, a special pleasure to be here. Uh, I also appreciate the invitation to think a bit harder about uh, professionalism in medical education. A actually, I went on after my internal medicine uh, residency and did a two-year uh, fellowship supported by the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation with a concentration in um, medical ethics. I because of, frankly, as much as anything else, timing and being in the Bay Area became an HIV physician. So I had a lot of opportunity to think about emerging bioethical problems um, in HIV, initially very locally, but relatively quickly I began to think about the global HIV uh, epidemic, which is a large part of um, how I've ended up with my uh, brand new job. In, um, people often ask me what surprised me in the course of wrestling, really for four years, with um, medical education <clears throat> and trying to come up with a, a, a synthesis uh, that might be useful going forward. And one of the things, despite my background, that surprised me was how um, central the concept of professionalism became to us as we thought about what medical education is really about. Now, that's, that's easy to say. But kind of what do we mean by professionalism and what do we mean by saying that it's uh, central? I'm actually not going to talk, uh, you, you, won't, you won't see the book again, and I'm not really going to talk about the major findings of the book because I have used this uh, opportunity to try and advance my thinking a bit. I, I took the word seminar literally, so I don't have a huge number of slides, and I would very much appreciate um, comment, critique, if, if what I'm saying is um, incompletely thought out or makes no sense whatsoever. I would actually really, really appreciate having that pointed out to me. Uh, uh, I have learned a lot um, from uh, constructive uh, critique over the years. So w one of the things that I began to realize uh, as I thought about what I wanted to talk with you about was how much harm uh, has been done or has possibly been done to the concept of professionalism by medical education over the past, I don't know, let's say 15 years. And you know, why do I say that? that that's actually the, the, the center part of my um, remarks uh, uh, with you today. But one of the things that was really striking, so how do we do this book? For me, it was really sort of um, analogous to doing doctoral research. I, you know, I must have read 2,500 papers. Uh, like, like many physicians, I'm sort of a self-taught uh, educator, and I've had the good fortune to be well-received. But I had never had the opportunity to devote a a real chunk of time to saying, you know, what do we know about what works and what doesn't work in medical education? And even backing up a step from that, what do we know about how people learn and how, we, uh, how might we apply these emerging understandings more effectively 
uh, to medical education. So this was a, a fantastic opportunity to really step back and, and become educated myself about medical education. But another piece of the effort involved field work. In contrast to Flexner, who almost single-handedly visited every medical school then extant in North America um, in the course of about three years, which is especially remarkable considering what the state of transportation was like in 1906, 1907. Um, we did not Though we had airplanes at our command, I suppose, the, the, the um, uh, operation of medical education is so vastly more complicated than it was 100 years ago, we didn't uh, begin to set ourselves out the goal of visiting every place. But we did go to 20 medical schools and residency programs, including some residency programs that aren't based in medical schools. And, and we typically spent three days talking to teachers, uh, medical center leaders, medical students, residents, and we using a, a structured focus groups. So we covered the same material um, in the course of these uh, series of visits. And what we heard about professionalism from the learners now, what we heard from the teachers was, we take this very seriously, here's our program, here's our advising system, here's our, here are our evaluation forms. What we heard from students in general was, kinda, we think this is a crock. We, we, uh, we heard, you know, if your mother didn't teach you this, by the time you were five, it's way too late. Um, we heard a lot of conflation, and this was, uh, I think, just a, an accident of time, with medical centers' interest in patient satisfaction, press gainy. So the residents would complain a lot. You know, I got dinged by my clinic patients because they can't park. And, you know, and so there was a, a fair amount of cynicism and pushback. And, and I, I think that we're, in fact, a bit to blame for that. Uh, residents and medical students, for that matter, didn't really understand what professionalism was. And I've already kind of given some examples to that, of that. And that's, I think, understandable. It's, it's what the social scientists like to call an ill-defined construct. And people project um, a lot of different ideas of what they think is important onto it because it's not uh, inherently clear uh, what it is. Um, but I don't think this is a hopeless case and I, and I hope we end up um, at the end feeling optimistic uh, that, that we can restore professionalism to what I think its full um, importance. But uh, as I have already said, we are starting with a understanding of professionalism among many learners that is reductionist and oversimplified, I think. Uh, and and uh, I've already uh, talked with you a little bit um, about that. At the same time, in the course of thinking about um, professionalism, some serious uh, critics have called to our attention that it may not be possible, it may not even be um, a good idea at all to roll back to the, the clock to what Fred Hafferty has called a nostalgic view of uh, professionalism. And I, um, I think there's a lot for us um, to learn here. Certainly, n this picture by Luke Fildes from the 18, late 1880s, I believe, is shown in about half the talks I've ever been to on the doctor-patient relationship. There's something that really 
speaks to us about this uh, doctor keeping vigil by the bedside of this very sick child and the distraught mother and the attentive father there um, in the uh, background. Uh, so a question is raised for me, do we have to choose between this nostalgic view of uh, uh, professionalism or a dimension of professionalism and something else that may not have the, the full emotional appeal that uh, this does. And again, to, to uh, anticipate myself a bit, I'm uh, going to conclude by saying, I, I think that this is not an either or. This is, uh, I hope, a, a we can do both uh, situation. But at the same time that the, our medical center leaders are uh, focusing residents' attention and to some extent students' attention on patient satisfaction, we actually have serious students uh, raising the question of, you know, can this idea that many physicians walk around with of what professionalism is be um, sustained and supported in the 21st um, uh, century? At the same time that students feel or learners feel a bit put upon in terms of um, what their uh, clinical environments are expecting of them uh, in terms of uh, patient satisfaction and performance, they look at us and are often a bit disappointed by what they see. Now, I could have represented this a couple of different ways, but this map from 2008 was prepared by um, AMSA, the American Medical Student Association, uh, which had begun in 2007 working on medical school conflict of interest report cards. So they were asking the question, you know, our faculty are evaluating us on our professionalism. What do we find when we look at the, at the schools we're going to in terms of policies that apply to faculty? And um, this picture, the, 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 oh, the key doesn't, um, uh, I, I guess the key is really self-explanatory. So 149 medical schools, the green dots, uh, the light green dots are, uh, represent schools that have policies that AMSA rated A in terms of faculty conflict of interest, dark green is B, and so on to yellow, which you can see predominates here, is incomplete. The, so the school either didn't have a policy, had an incomplete policy, or declined, as many schools did in 2007, 2008, to even tell AMSA what their policy was. Now, things have changed. So here's the same report card um, from 2011, 2012. And for, for parents in the room, a lesson you might take from this is that Small doses of shame appropriately applied may not be the worst thing in the world. Because you can see that there are more schools are reporting, there are far fewer incompletes, um, there are way more uh, A and B grades. Uh, there are many other anecdotes that I could tell from the field work about what students and residents saw uh, as I'll call them professionalism uh, lapses among their uh, faculty. But of course, uh, it doesn't matter what the anecdote is. Uh, anytime uh, learners see people exhorting them to do A, who are then turning around and doing B, that's a, a breeding ground for cynicism. And we heard about that a lot. 
another uh, challenge for this larger conception of professionalism that I think uh, many of us would really like to transmit uh, to our learners is uh, our approach to um, its assessment. And in any ill-defined construct is going to be difficult to assess, right? And the more it uh, uh, the more we're trying to assess things that are not directly observable, the, the more difficult the assessment becomes and the more uneasy uh, psychometricians and people who are psychometrically oriented, which includes, as it should, many people involved with high stakes evaluation, but they become uncomfortable, uh, which has led the um, uh, National Board of Medical Examiners to actually invest a huge amount of money in what to me is, this project is, is annoyingly called, annoyingly and correctly called, uh, assessment of professional behaviors. And MBME is actually, I, I'm a board member I should say, and, and about twice a year I say something in public about MBME that then leads me to write Don Melnick an email saying I said this and I'll resign if you think I should and he's very tolerant of me so he, he knows how I feel about this. I mean I think the professional behaviors are absolutely the kind of rock bottom of what we should be um, concerned with. And if we leave our assessment there because that's what we're comfortable with, again, what we're doing, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see this, is um, encouraging our very intelligent and responsive learners to adapt by looking like they're professional, which I think all of us would say is an entirely different thing than being uh, professional. So uh, again, uh, this, uh, I'm, I'm trying to support my argument that in the course of trying to do something that is um, important, the way that we have done it may have been really at cross purposes uh, to our intention. So another, and I, I, uh, I actually looked for a, a title uh, that I could um, uh, use as a prompter, um, put you in mind of this and, and didn't find one on my computer easily, but um, while we're talking about this, let me say a word about the work of my beloved colleague, Maxine Papadakis who uh, is a, a national, if not international, leader in um, uh, this area of um, professionalism and assessment of learner professionalism. And for uh, anyone in the room who doesn't know, Max published a very important paper in 2005 or 2006 in which she and colleagues, and this was really hard work what they did, uh, they looked at practicing physicians who had been sanctioned by their state medical boards in three different states and then looked backwards um, sometimes as much as 40 years. They reviewed the uh, narrative comments about those sanctioned Amazing. physicians in a uh, blinded, structured way and demonstrated, this was basically a retrospective case control study, uh, demonstrated that there were um, characterizations of uh, medical student performance that were strongly associated with the risk of um, state sanction uh, decades later uh, in practice. This is very helpful work. Anybody who's had the um, unpleasant experience of sitting down with a, a medical student or a resident who needs to be talked to 
um, about a professionalism issue has likely heard, you know, that's so subjective. The person who said that doesn't know me very well. That person, or you, you just don't like me. Uh, so the ability to connect um, students' experience with their current um, assessments um, in medical school or residency with, um, with high stakes problems down the road is, um, is an important, that's an important counseling tool, I think. But fortunately, the vast majority of uh, students and residents get through their entire educational experience without running afoul of this kind of situation. We have an absolute obligation, I believe, as educators to have systems in place to detect uh, this level of problem and intervene and, and remediate where we can, can and uh, uh, counsel people, frankly, out of medicine if we can't re remediate these serious kinds of problems. But that leaves 80, 85, 90 percent of our learners without any real compass. As long as they're staying clear of this real badness, uh, we're, we're not necessarily as educators holding up for them a kind of professionalism excellence to aspire to. Now, fortunately, I, I saw that uh, I think it was I think it was Vinny has spoken to you already mm -hmm. about um, old world professionalism in a new era, and and we see that at UCSF. I I know you see it here. We s see learners who, despite the fact that we may be pretty much obsessed by the bottom feeders, are still looking scanning their environment for um, people to admire, for behaviors to emulate, back to the, to the um, question that uh, I got earlier, and, and commitments to make. But I would argue that we need to be doing much more for that large majority of learners who aren't going um, aren't to fall into the professionalism deficit or kind of lapse category and help them uh, uh, understand what real um, excellence looks like. So I've finished making the comments that I wanted to make about why, or at least some of the reasons that I think our students and residents um, uh, may have a reduced trivialized or inadequate conception of uh, professionalism. But I'm, I'm now going to put this in uh, a somewhat larger context because our profession uh, is challenged now as uh, certainly all the physicians in the audience know and anyone who's done much reading or thinking about being a physician in uh, 2012 has uh, undoubtedly um, encountered as well. There are a, a number of changes underway in how medicine is practiced, how it's experienced by um, physicians, um, and, and how it's um, managed by society that many physicians experience as an assault, which is why I'm, I'm showing uh, this image. Now, again, I don't think we have to think about it this way, but many people do. I have a, um, I'm privileged to have a leadership role in the American College of Physicians, and we hear this all the time from our members that sort of why is the college capitulating to 
whether it's pay for performance or you know, any one of a number of changes that are clearly well underway um, in American medicine. And our learners um, see this as well. So one of the things that, that I think is very interesting um, and has, holds as much opportunity as challenge if we can figure out how to work with the opportunity is that physicians are no longer in control of the high knowledge that, uh, that is the, the sort of factual and conceptual basis of medical practice. You know, if you read about the uh, sociology of professions, and again, you, you, people who are regular attendees at this seminar have heard from uh, very uh, skilled sociologists about this. The, the basic concept from the non-sociologist is that there is a body of privileged knowledge and skills that is restricted to the members of the profession in exchange for self-regulation and, and service to society. But the idea that we um, are, are the exclusive uh, portals uh, for the public to this information, that's long gone. Uh, again, um, ACP members, uh, uh, many of them rebel against this. Why, why are you not fighting against expanded scope of practice for nurse practitioners? Why are you not um, saying um, uh, very uh, critical things about minute clinics? Like there comes up in, in any number of ways. But this horse is way out of the barn. So I love this slide. Uh, Hugo Campos is a, I think he's an IT person in the East Bay where I live. Uh, unfortunately, he has a hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy. Um, and for that reason, he has a uh, implantable, implanted uh, cardiac defibrillator. And he has been in now a several year battle with the FDA and his device manufacturer because he wants the raw data from his device. And people say, his website is actually very entertaining. Uh, people say, well, that would be a HIPAA violation. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but the, the long and short of it, and, and the, the thing that clearly people say most frequently is you wouldn't understand it. And he says, give me the data and then we'll see. No, if I don't understand it, I'll ask. Here, he, so he has formed a users group, being a good IT guy, and he has learned how to hack into his device. So, and, and there's just going to be any number of examples like this, where, where people are basically crowdsourcing um, information uh, about their own, about uh, conditions they have or that a family member has, and uh, doing what they want with that information. So th this is a done deal. And we're going to need to figure out how to interact with people like Mr. Campos um, in a professional way because we cannot roll back the clock to a time when you know, physicians could read and patients couldn't um, or some more uh, modern but still highly asymmetric uh, relationship between uh, patients and uh, physicians. So I already mentioned um, P for P. Uh, if I had thought of it in time, my colleague on the Board of Regents of the ACP, uh, Faith Fitzgerald, who here knows Faith Fitzgerald? A, a couple of people do. Well, she would have had me have a uh, circus seal with a ball on the end of its nose to go with this uh, slide. It, 
she, she is, as are many physicians, profoundly insulted by just the term uh, pay for, per, for performance. I mean, her, her argument being that it ought to be a fundamental attribute of physicians that we perform, if that's what you want to call it, at the highest level of our capabilities as a matter of course. Uh, but this is another horse that's well out of the barn. And I, as somebody who also speaks about cost of care, uh, at this point, I think we need to entrain really any uh, mechanisms we can to try and uh, get um, clinicians across the board more focused on uh, quality, efficiency, patient outcomes, uh, and uh, cost consciousness. But this is another uh, secular trend that many physicians are experiencing as a kind of a, a deprofessionalizing um, uh, trend. And then there's bad physicians. And there's no dearth of uh, access to detailed information, uh, um, you know, sort of horribly fascinating information about bad physicians. Now, there have always been bad physicians. I have no doubt of it. Uh, but the ability to learn about bad physicians is vastly uh, enhanced in the digital era. And I have to say as well, the opportunities for physicians to be bad on a spectacular scale um, is also uh, much greater than it was when, you know, if, if I were a complete venal quack, my little village had to deal with it. But it would have been hard, um, it would have been impossible until 1965 uh, to uh, bilk Medicare out of $375 million. It, 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 and you're, you're not surprised that uh, if not the public in general, the public is represented by our legislators are completely scandalized by this kind of thing and use it as evidence that we need more oversight and more regulation. And you, you really can't blame them. So I'm wrapping up now. Uh, I had not encountered this paper until I got, uh, was preparing to uh, do this uh, talk. So the title is, Hero or Has Been, Is There a Future for Altruism in uh, Medical Education? And actually, these uh, authors, Bishop and Reese, basic, basically conclude that there's not. Um, and I'd ask you for the purposes of this talk to consider altruism a key dimension of this old-fashioned um, professionalism that Fred Hafferty suggests that we may be nostalgic about. And, and I will acknowledge that uh, when the um, physician charter uh, was promulgated, if that's exactly the right word, uh, in the early um, part of the first uh, decade of the century and, and was being talked about among uh, various stakeholder groups, uh, medical students and residents um, rated the altruism principle their least favorite. So the, 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 that was basically um, expressed as putting the needs of patients ahead of your own. And uh, this generation of 
medical students and residents, not, not every last one, but many people said, that's not something I'll sign on to. And it, the, the main <coughs> reservation had to do with, well, some of it had to do with kind of practicality or practical application. What do you, what do you actually mean by that? And how far does uh, uh, that principle go in expecting me to um, suppress my own um, needs and desires for uh, someone else's? Uh, but there's also been clearly a significant secular trend uh, within medicine as well as more broadly in terms of promoting work-life balance, um, a, a personal kind of wholeness. We should take time for ourselves and our families away from patients. We should recreate in various ways that are important to us. And having sat in on some of these groups, that's what learners say. The, the needs of um, other people, whether they're people actually in my panel or people who could be in my panel or people in my community with health problems, it's always going to uh, exceed my ability to meet them and certainly my ability to meet them and accommodate uh, other legitimate interests uh, that I have. So, so what do we do uh, with this situation where learners have a reduced uh, image of or, or concept of professionalism? The profession itself, at least, um, is uh, experienced by some physicians uh, as under assault. Is there still a role? for what I'll call a capacious concept of professionalism and what might that look like in uh, 2012 and, and beyond. So here's our city on the hill um, intending to convey to you that I think that this is actually not just a critical task for us now, but actually quite an exciting one as educators, uh, reworking our uh, understanding of professionalism so that it does what we want it to do for the profession so our learners understand it and can aspire to it. So I, oh, I'm going to go back for a second. I will argue, and I don't think I get much um, objection to this argument, that people still come to medicine um, as uh, students and residents, by and large, with an intense desire to help people. I had a wonderful dinner last night um, with a number of you uh, who are working as I am about to do in the area of global health. And I think that global health and the enthusiasm for global health, which, you know, it, it, it has a few sort of um, underbelly issues, but in general, is a manifestation of how much people want to help and the magnitude of problems that people are interested in tackling um, as they begin their medical studies. So these are not people who are saying, I want to learn to look like I'm a professional. These are people who are saying, there's really bad problems, whether, whether you're talking about the slums of Kampala or migrant workers in Fresno, uh, where, where I actually do a fair amount of work. These are, these are gnarly problems. And there are many forces working against their resolution. But I want to be part of the solution. So I absolutely don't think, I think that's what we need to capitalize on. And we need to hang on to this big idea that may not be complete, may be a little inchoate, it may not be completely formed, 
as our learners bring it to us. But we shouldn't reduce it in the course of helping them specify it. We should keep it big. Uh, in addition to, uh, so all right, let me see what I, uh, I actually didn't, I, I thought I had a different slide here, but that's fine. Uh, there is a concept uh, that I'm now going to borrow from, from the so-called learning sciences. It used to be, uh, well, it still is, if you are um, a sort of a, a cognitive, uh, classic cognitive psychologist, that you think about learning in terms of taking whether it's facts from your brain or concepts from your brain or schemas from your brain and and teaching is the process of getting them into somebody else's brain. So there's the teacher and the learner and the and teaching is about this uh, transaction. A I think much more it's certainly a more modern conception, and it's, uh, to me, a more interesting conception, says that knowledge is thickly distributed in uh, a number of environments, and, and particularly, and specifically, because that's what we're talking about, the medical environment. There's all kinds of information all over the place. Um, some of it's in other people. But some of it's in forms that we have to fill out. The, the, that that uh, those forms may request information. They structure our approach to problems. Um, we've just implemented EPIC. And we're personalizing or customizing EPIC so that uh, for a particular kind of consultation, I'm a general internist, I need to supply the rheumatologist with some information. And the form reminds me that uh, if I'm asking the question, does this patient have rheumatoid arthritis, it will help the rheumatologist if I've drawn a CCP. And th that information, if I forget, as I am wont to do, the form reminds me. And that's an example of information that's distributed in the environment. So this is, this is actually not, not the best graphic I have for this, but this is a activity system schema. Uh, activity uh, theory uh, was developed in the 30s by several Russian psychologists. And really all they're doing here, and this has been customized to apply to Dennis, is pointing out exactly what uh, I was just doing, that there's information in the dental instruments about um, how you are, how you ought to use that instrument, as a, for example. So there's information everywhere. Our junior colleague writing the book, Bridget O'Brien, said to me one day, if it's true that cognition or knowledge is distributed in the environments in which uh, clinicians work, might it also be true that professionalism is distributed in the environment that in which uh, we work and learn. And it, it, was a, it was a wonderful insight. Of course, Bridget turned out not to be the first person to have had that insight, uh, but it was a very important one. Is Dane Levinson here? No. Oh, I, I so <laughs> admire this paper. This is a, a lovely piece of work taking Bridget's observation um, and also a bit of Fred's impatience with the nostalgic view of professionalism and saying, you know, can't we think about this in a more complex way? Now, you know, I don't know when the learning sciences were being developed if, if objectors said, if you think about knowledge being distributed in the environment, then it's not important what knowledge an individual has in her head. But certainly nobody says that now. They're, they're both important. 
And some of the uh, sort of in the mediating skills are maybe even more important. Do I know whether what is in my head is adequate? And if it's not adequate, do I know efficiently how to get out of my head and, and get the information that I need to apply to the case? And I think that that, that way of thinking exactly applies here, that we want people to carry around their own strong individual professional values. But we have to recognize that people work in complex environments in relationship. And, and the environments and the relationships impose very strong influences for good or evil on what people do in a particular uh, situation. All of this is, again, as the learning scientists like to say, situated. I mean, we're, we're really talking about decisions people make and actions they take in a particular context. It's, these are not, this is not an abstraction. And I'll close by using my beer bottle here uh, to uh, tell a story from our uh, field work. You can, if I tell the story, my guess is that there are going to be people in the room who can guess where this happened. Uh, we were doing a, uh, I was doing a uh, focus group with internal medicine residents, and I was going through the interview schedule, and I got to the professionalism part. And there, there had already been some very interesting things in this focus group about how these residents talked about professionalism. Uh, but I said, so what does it really mean to you? And one of the residents told a story about a resident sort of just before him who, this is, a, a, this is like a quaternary or beyond that referral site. So there are many people come to this place from all over who have been told by their physicians where they live this is not a curable condition. Um, so this is a, a place of last resort. And uh, this resident about whom the story was being told was taking care of somebody with a widely metastatic malignancy who ha had been told at home this is not something that we can cure. We can palliate, we can do all the good things that we're supposed to do, but we cannot cure this. So he arrived at uh, the place that we were visiting and this resident was assigned to take care of him. And in the course of chatting with the patient, the uh, resident had learned that one of the things that he missed the most about being at home with this horrible illness was a particular favorite beer. And uh, so the resident took an afternoon off and found this beer and brought it in. And the resident telling the story said, you know, I'm sure there's some rule against that. But to me, that's professionalism. So <laughs> we, I, I, I put this story, the story is in the book. And <laughs> somebody reading the book said, you know, actually, that was me. I did that. But the, that person had finished the residency program like 15 years earlier. But this story is so in the culture at this institution that the resident talked about it as though, you know, this just happened. Uh, so I, uh, I, I love this story. You can actually do a whole lot of other things with professionalism and what it means and knowing when to break rules and so on and so forth. Uh, but what I think we're looking for are, is a, a way to build back in these aspirational dimensions of profi uh, physician performance that many of our learners come to us already holding in high regard. This is um, David Stern and Louise Arnold's, I call it the temple of professionalism. Um, they're 
uh, intention in drawing it this way is that there are foundational um, elements of ethical and legal understanding, communication skills, and so on and so forth, where you can say, you pass. The verticals are things that we're never good enough at. Um, they are the, uh, the aspirations that support our desire to tackle these really big problems recognizing that most of the time you're not going to entirely fix the really big problem. Uh, and uh, as I said, I think it's that capacious view of professionalism that our learners bring us and that we need to build on. So I have arrived at the end. I think we have a few minutes for questions or Thank comments. You. Yeah. I realize people have one o'clock issues. And Some do. Yeah. Marshall. Yeah. I was going to share a story from your past. This leads from my past. From your past. Uh oh. <laughs> 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 well, I was a at UCSF in the late '80s, and the last month of your fourth year, the great course at that time, which was sort of a, some ways a preparation for internship, we you know, review some clinical issues, but then there were special topics. Mm. I remember the month was a great month. But the only lecture I remember is yours mm. on when you make a mistake. Mm. You know, I don't know if you still do that or not in terms of that, that topic. But you know, in some ways, like through medical school and residency, professionalism was basically finding role models. Mm -hmm. you know, but it was hard to quantify then in terms of actual training. And throughout your talk, I mean, you raised a lot of issues in terms of the challenge of professionalism defining it. But you assiduously actually avoided talking about how do you increase professionalism within trainees? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, are we left at, in terms of, you know, hopefully you have great role models like, you know, my story at UCSF, mm -hmm. or, you know, what have you learned in terms of the recommendations you make then for us here trying to uh, teach professionalism? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, and, and that's, uh, I, I got farther than I did in the book, but I'm still kind of uh, working on this issue. Uh, I. I absolutely, well, let me start with something that I think is a destructive force that is easily addressed. I shouldn't say easily, but can be addressed. If, uh, and I've done this experiment a bunch of times, uh, you ask an audience of physicians to re recall the or a most powerful um, professionalizing experience in which they really got some uh, a strong insight into what it means to be a doctor in a good way. Most of those things happen at night. If you, if you ask people, did it happen during the daytime or did it happen at night? Most of them happen at night. And I think there's a whole bunch of reasons why that is. Um, and some of it may just be what people recall, but they re it's important if that's what they recall, that that's what they recall. And so there's a lot of concern about what's going on. And now the interns don't spend the night in the hospital. Uh, so, so does that mean that they have a year without those kinds of opportunities? I think continuity is a, a, a extremely powerful uh, professionalizing force and we have allowed for a variety of reasons our learners experiences to become highly discontinuous uh, so I, I think that building back continuity uh, is critically important and we see examples in the third year clerkships that uh, are longitudinal integrated clerkships. Every place that's doing that has amazing stories about what students did out of their um, strong connections with patients over time. I also think that strong, I very much uh, appreciate your story. Um, but in general, I think that strong connections between uh, learners and teachers over time are really important as well. So th that can be supported in the organization of, of clinical work in, uh, at UCSF, as uh, a number of places have done. We have brought into the curriculum 
uh, a number of activities that students come to medical school caring a lot about. And we have, if you'll excuse the um, uh, ugly word, we have curricularized those. Global health is one of them and it's, it's intensely popular. And that's another way of uh, putting learners in proximity with uh, more senior people who are committed, and I've used this word a lot with, fully, with full intent, who are committed uh, to the things that they're committed to. And, and I don't, I mean, you're a, a, a very a seasoned teacher. I don't need to say that I think preaching about this stuff just, it, it, it does very little good. It mostly annoys the learners. It, it's letting them have the opportunity to do authentic work side by side with um, uh, people who can guide and mentor them. And uh, I think you could clear out a lot of space in both medical school and residency, certainly at places like the ones that we're fortunate to work in with the caliber of learners that we have. We, you could clear out a lot of room without um, interfering with the acqu acquisition of the clinical excellence that's, to me, foundational. I mean, I'm, I'm a practicing clinician. So I, I think in the end, you, you, know, you don't have much of a doctor in that sense if, if the person is not very strong clinically. But there's room to do, what, do other things as well. well I, oh, I, th yeah, yeah. I think your answer to Marshall may, may have been the answer to the question I'm about to raise. Yeah. But early, early in your talk, um, you suggested that medical educators and medical education may have done considerable harm to medical professionalism. And, and you pointed out you, your observation, which I, I must say uh, I share, mm -hmm. um, of, the, of the enthusiasm that the teachers bring to teaching it, but the cynicism yeah, that the learners teach. bring to learning yeah. about it. And, and the questions that they raise about, is, is this a, a teachable mm -hmm. skill, mm -hmm. professionalism? And, and I th thought you were getting sort of to get at that mm -hmm. answer it, when you said that for the kind of learners that we work with, there might be a lot of room that could be cleared to permit the legitimate kind of professional um, development and modeling to take place. Mm -hmm. Just, did I get it right yeah. or? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I don't know if you, when you're talking about our enthusiasm for teaching, um, you're specifically talking about teaching of ethics. Well, I uh, was talking more, I think yeah, I was talking yeah, more generally, yeah, yeah. teaching of medicine, right. ethics, professionalism. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that we're enthusiastic in what we want to pass along. Yeah. Uh, well, so, so, I mean, I do think that there are some generational um, uh, trends underway uh, that, again, we, you can't roll back the clock, and, and uh, you hear a lot about, you know, they're just not the way they used to be. They're, they, they're, they won't work hard, they're this, they're that. That's just, I mean, that's sort of, an, uh, to me, an unhelpful um, approach. Uh, I am working with a student now who um, has raised some issues for me uh, in terms of uh, effort and initiative. And when I talked with him about it, I mean, he, he has a, 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 lot, a number of Gen Y characteristics, if you sort of believe in this slicing at all. But you know, he said, I have got a very rich and complicated life, and I don't want medicine to take it over. So I said, fine, I get that. I don't care if you want to work 6% time. <laughs> that's fine with me. But that piece of, the, of your life that is medicine has to be done to a certain standard. And I'm, I'm not seeing that. Now, and this is pretty typical of Gen Y, again, if you believe this stuff, when I told him that, 
he told me some things that were disappointing about me. That's OK. And, but then he fixed what I was talking to him about. So uh, people can need, some people can need some very clear guidance about what it is that we're expecting. Since I projected onto your question ethics teaching, um, I, it seems to me that you absolutely need to, um, to hook into the student's own experience. So I teach in our third year intercession program, and the students come back from their clerkships all over. And you know, Bernie Lowe always arms us with these paper cases. And I, I, I refuse to use them. <laughs> and I tell the students at the beginning, I'm not going to use the paper cases. And we will just sit here in silence if you won't share some of the things that you've seen happen. And there's always quite a long silence because they don't believe me. They, you know, they think they can outweigh me. <laughs> uh, but then someone will say, well, I have a case, but it's not very good. So, I mean, they, they bring in these conceptions about what a good case is. And we always get a great discussion. And it's better for one practical reason, which is with the paper case, you know, there's nobody there to say, you know, that the husband really rubbed me the wrong way. There's, there's just not enough reality to them. Um, but the second thing is, well, it's really the same thing. The, the, the case that the student brings is bothering them somehow. And, and that's what's, I mean, that's what's teachable. That's what I learned from yeah. Al and Kasuistry, yeah. is that really is what you're looking for. I was just curious, when you were going through the country, yeah. were there any differences between institutions that were um, much more smaller and primary care based, mm. much more clinically based yeah. institutions, <laughs> and tertiary care centers, um, just having trained at both types yeah. of institutions, um, sometimes mentorship is a little bit different when it comes from somebody that is on um, a strictly clinical path that um, maybe has a clinic much more often and you, and you see them yeah. on a more yeah. uh, continuous basis versus yeah. people that have much more segmented yeah. care of patients and, and much more focus on, yeah. on a non-clinical path. So um, overall, the places that have the most challenge um, doing this really well are places like the one where I work, it, big, academic health centers. They have very complicated and often somewhat conflicting missions, uh, which the, particularly the residents, I, I think students don't perceive this as much because they're a bit insulated. But you know, one of the surgery residents at, um, at UCSF said one day, you know, we talk about we're a medical school and we've got, uh, now we talk about having uh, four key missions, um, teaching, clinical care, research, and community service, which got crammed down leadership's <laughs> uh, throat at a, a retreat about 10 years ago. But the, the, the surgery resident said, no, we're really here so the faculty can do their research. <laughs> and he wasn't particularly hostile. He was just realistic. And they, I mean, they see faculty doing their assigned uh, teaching hours and then, you know, roaring back to the lab or wherever it is that they're going. Uh, who, who thinks they know where the beer story comes from? Just guess. Wisconsin. Well, close. It's Mayo. <laughs> And Mayo is, uh, it's a, is, it's a one-off place, really. We didn't see any place like it. Uh, but if you go around and look at medical education and say, what's your mission statement? They all basically have the same mission statement. 
you spend three days, and you know, I often wanted to rewrite their mission statement. Your, your mission statement is not your real mission. Here's your real mission. At Mayo, the, they, they still um, uh, say exactly what the brothers Mayo said, which is it's all about the care of the patient. It, 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 we got to, it got to be a joke by halfway through the second day. How long would we be in a focus group before someone said, it's all about the care of the patient. And I, I swear you could have uh, done a focus group of custodians. And they would have said, it's all about the care of the patient. So that, they had a consistency of vision uh, that, that everybody picked up on. But uh, that's atypical. And it's, it's um, very atypical at, at the really big academic uh, um, uh, health centers like ours. Now that doesn't mean, you know, uh, University of Washington, I don't usually do this, but University of Washington is interesting because they manage a pretty bimodal mission uh, well. I asked a, a third year student who wanted to be, who I'm, I'm sure will be, an academic neurosurgeon how he liked being sent out during his third year as part of the WAMI program to a, you know, a little hamlet in northern Idaho, 1,200 people to do family medicine. And he said, well, that's, this is where my patients are going to come from. They're not all going to come from Seattle. And I need to understand what the life is like of the family physician who's going to take care of my brain tumor patient when I send him home. So he had gotten that. Our students, when we try to send them to Fresno, say, you know, I don't like it here. Now, and, you know, I, I, I can't go to my favorite. I'm being a little mean. I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if it's in time or not, but we're often talking about altruism uh -huh. that I try to understand. It's always say, patient come first. Yeah, so yeah, it, yeah. to me, it looks like. Uh, does my wife come first or my mother? Yeah, it, yeah. It, to me, it is both is first. Yeah. Patient and I come first, yeah. both of us, proportional based on our needs. So for example, if, if I understand the individual rights yeah. and justice, then, um, then I could handle both. I am not sacrificing anything for patient if it's, say, I am a surgeon and I have an opera teacher mm -hmm. and tonight a patient comes that mm -hmm. needs yeah. operation. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not sacrificing anything if I stay because it's a part of my profession. Yeah. I part enjoy of who you it. Are. So the patient here yeah. is not first. This yeah. is a part of my yeah. profession. Yeah. On the other hand, if there's really no need that yeah. I admit him tonight and I get this opera teacher the yeah. night tomorrow, yeah. it's yeah. just as fine. Yeah. Yeah. And I am first, so we are not really sacrificing ours because we understand our duty. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What, what is our duty mm -hmm. in relation? And therefore, I don't understand who comes first and who comes second. Yeah, That's yeah. what I am saying. Yeah. Yeah, no. be before you answer, I, I just want to tell you a story. There was a cardiac surgeon here many years ago, but, but you would remember him if I told you his name, who had opera tickets and whose wife was a great opera buff, who was doing a patient of mine on a night when a particularly important opera was going to be sung. And I, I went into the OR and the wife's voice is coming across the intercom saying, where are you? We're going to be late for the opera. Yeah, yeah. And my voice is right there saying, stay here and finish the case. This is the theater. <laughs> this, this is where you belong. And so you had these two, these two voices with the opera tickets in, in the middle. Right. So I was a little unfair to the authors of the you know, altruism hero or has been um, paper because I said that they really said it's a has-been concept, and they don't quite say that. What, what you did telling the story is you contextualized that question. Right. 
And, and that's, I mean, that's what we need to be teaching. Sometimes the patient does come first, and, and sometimes you have to give up something you would for sure like to do. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's a, a knowing when you don't have to do that and when you do, that, that is a sophisticated manifestation of, of professionalism. And it does get to this um, uh, fundamental point that we, that I, I again, I was, I was just in reflection so struck by um, the attention we ended up paying to having our learners become become physicians, not act like physicians. You, you, you know, you're saying, you know, I just, I know that difference now. So you're not, it, it's not a rule, it, it's part of who you are. And that's what we're aiming for. Molly, So thank, thank you very much. Thank I, you. I really appreciate uh, the chance to talk with you.